Hi guys, welcome to vlogging from the classroom. We are presenting today as part of the ADE Apple Distinguished Educator Festival of Learning. And we are excited to share today ways that you can empower your students to demonstrate their understanding of new things that they have learned in the classroom through video. And we are going to be going through lots of different strategies and tools that you can provide your students with. And today I'm here with my friend Tyler Tarver, who is also an Apple Distinguished Educator and incredible human being and all of the things. He's a content creator. Let, how many followers do you have right now on YouTube, Tyler? Well, you follow me and that's the only person I care about. Okay. <laughs> that's all I care about. So I, I appreciate you inviting me to be a part of this and I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started and let's look at and let's talk. Oh, here's our contact information. If you have any questions and you want to email either one of us later on, here's our email addresses. And then I just put in our Twitter handles. Is that what we call our Twitter, our Twitter names, Twitter handles. Um, yeah. So if you want to find us there, I know Tyler shares a ton of content out on Twitter. He's also on TikTok. I um, love TikTok. If you're not on teacher TikTok, you guys get on there. It's some of the best content for educators ever. Yeah, I'm on TikTok, but I'm just one of those people that lurks right now. I just watch a lot of TikTok. I need I need to challenge myself to create some content on TikTok. I really do. I did for Absolutely. like a, a minute during when the pandemic first hit. I made mm -hmm. some content for my students and I think they really got into that. But then um, once things kind of got back to normal, I kind of got away from that. But TikTok is super fun. It's such a fun platform. I love the short video format. And we're going to talk about how you can work that into this vlogging concept today, too, just a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I love it. And that's the thing, too. When we talk through vlogging, I know traditionally people think YouTube, but it, it could be there are people that vlog on TikTok, people that vlog on Instagram, some that do that on Snapchat. The link doesn't matter. It could be a minute or less. It could be 30 seconds. It could be 20 minutes. Um, it could be anything. So, Lindsay, tell us what vlogging is. What is vlogging to you, Lindsay? What is vlogging? I had a few people reach out and ask me, what is vlogging? And the best way that I, I have found to describe it is, you know, we all know what a blog is, where someone journals in a written format. And a vlog is just a video version of that we're somewhat it's like an ongoing journal of either a lifestyle but when we relate it to education we're going to be vlogging from the classroom then it's just an ongoing video log of your students experiences and them logging what they have learned so in a way you could build a whole portfolio for your students of how they've grown and what they've learned over the course of either a nine weeks or a semester or a school year through creative expression in video which is a lot of fun for them what do you think about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. And, you know, traditionally people thought blogging was like, okay, so you're, you're just telling me about your day. You're, you're giving me a highlight reel of your day. Whereas blogging the best, those, that is some, some people vlogs like, here's just some clips of my day and I'll narrate them. Um, the best ones though, are ones that tell a story. And, you know, we all know that whenever we want to connect with students in our class, whenever we want to have, um, you know, that student engagement, Tying any key point around a story is going to lead to longer learning and a deeper learning because there is a connection with it. It's like the phrase works because stories stick, stories stick. And so, um, you know, telling or teaching something through a vlog, it's like you're telling a story, but in that process, you're wanting them to learn something. I think that's you're taking them on a journey, Lindsay. Take them right. on the journey with you. It's like the never ending story, Lindsay. You ever seen that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love I love that movie. That was one so of my childhood good. favorites for sure. So okay, good. so let's talk about three reasons why you should get your students vlogging. Well, for them, it's going to replicate an authentic experience. Our kids right now, when you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, nine times out of ten, they're going to tell you what they want to be. What they want to be a YouTuber. They, they want to be a YouTuber, <laughs> TikToker, an Instagram. They want to be an influencer. And YouTube is the best revenue stream to do that. Sorry. No, I was just, yes, I was agreeing, agreeing with you about the influencer. Um, 
Yeah. And even I used to teach elementary and they all wanted to be a YouTuber and then recently moved to the high school arena and they all want to be influencers. So either that just goes across all platforms, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, it hasn't changed. They all just want to be an influencer on social media. So this is going to connect with them. They are going to be able to relate with this idea of creating content because it's what they they consume now. And it's, it's kind of what they aspire to be. So you're giving them skills. Yes, you're teaching them your classroom content, but you're also empowering them to creatively express what they have learned and express themselves that they can then carry on to other um, parts of their life in beneficial ways. Um, and also by doing this, of course, we promote creativity and self-expression. And this is going to one of the things that I really noticed when I was doing this in my art room, when I would try to get my students to reflect on what they learned and ask them to write a reflection, they were not motivated by that. They did not want to write a reflection. And I needed some way to keep a log of how much they had grown, not just their piece of work, but also their thoughts about their piece of work and them telling me about their process and being able to express that. And when I asked them to do that in writing, we also had a large ESL population. Um, when I asked them to do that in writing, I wasn't seeing a lot of that academic language that I was looking for in my rubrics. So when I moved over to video and opened that up as a way for them to communicate, I noticed that they were much more motivated to tell me about their experience and to tell me, show me their process and to use some of that academic language that we tied to our art instruction. So those, those are the three reasons that I have for vlogging from the classroom and empowering my students to use video for a creative way to demonstrate their understanding. Have you used this with your college students at all? Yes, I have. Um, that's the thing. Whenever Whenever I look at like the world of education, we always talk about how education has been the same for a hundred years. Like, how do we change? I'm sitting here looking at what is the goal? Like, that's the thing. I'm always like, we get so in the procedure side, like, oh, I, I do this two page essay or I make them do this or I make them do this, this, you know, what is that trifold brochure thing? You know what I'm talking about? Like, what are they called? There's a thing for it. It's called a, uh, I think it's just called a brochure. I think brochure. I'm, yeah. Okay. So, um, whenever I would do like final exams for my college students, I would sit there and I'd be like, okay, my goal is that they have mastery over the subject, mastery over what it is I'm teaching, whether it's marketing, whether it's algebra, whether it's, you know, um, you know, skills for, for college students, whatever it is, I want to show they have mastery. Do I want to show that they can construct a paragraph? I think that's important, but that's not the goal of my class of my specific class is to show that mastery. And so whenever it came to the final exam, I told them, I was like, I've got a test. You can take that. You can write a paper. You can create a presentation and present it, or you can make a video. 90% of my students made videos to articulate the understanding they had. And they didn't have to be long videos because if you notice this, I've noticed when people start talking about a topic, the more they kind of ramble around it means they don't really know what they're talking about. People that can concisely tell me what something is and then translate that within the context of what I want from them. I think that shows a super a deep level of understanding that, that you might not get when somebody is forced to write a longer paper or to make a 20 minute video. I think if you can concisely say it, it means you have a great understanding of it. Um, my, okay. So we're talking about bloggers. We're talking about YouTubers in the chat. If you're watching this in the chat on the side, tell us a YouTuber that you watch a YouTuber that you like, or a YouTube channel that you enjoy. We'd love to see that over in the chat, throw that in as we move on to the next slide. Um, and I think one of the things you said there is that authentic, these students don't want anything that is not authentic. And I think whatever you do, whether it's you vlogging, your students vlogging, it is an authentic view of their expression, like their self-expression, how they can tie into that community. So I think that was very well articulated, Lindsay, very well articulated. Um, do you want me to click on these and go to these Instagrams? Yes. Or do you want to just say this is a resource for them? Um, no, these are examples of students vlogging from an elementary classroom. So the first two, I believe, are from kindergartners. And then the last one should be from a fifth grade class. But we'll um, look at this because I think it's so empowering to know that even kindergartners can do this. And we did all of this with just iPads. So the whole the whole experience of vlogging and sharing it out on a platform of your choice can happen. Um with an iPad. Can you guys see that? Are they, can they hear it? Is it playing? No, they, they, they probably can't hear it, but they, 
Can you hear that? No, but it's okay. I can just tell them what's going on here. So these yeah, talk through what's happening right now. Okay. So these fifth graders, um, what we what we were working on was continuous contour portrait drawings where they had to do it blind, where they couldn't look at what they were talking, what they were drawing. Um, and then this student here is just narrating about her learning experience and what she learned from it and how her confidence grew through that process. Um, but yeah, they just, we just set up different angles of the camera and then they recorded themselves. This is from kindergarten here. And um, this is a series of clay basics that kindergartners made. And then in the background, they're describing how they made in this video, how they made a pinch pot. So it's super easy. We did all of this with clips, very kid friendly. I would say that clips is probably if your students don't have any um, experience with creating video clips is so accessible for beginning video creators. To speak to that, my daughter, when she was seven, she would take a phone, go in and create an entire video through clips. She, she learned to edit on her own. She shot it, all of it. And here's the thing you think, well, they need to watch tutorials. Tutorials help. But the main thing is they just get the reps. They're doing it. They're creating, they're going back. Cause that's the thing. If anybody's ever edited video, you know, you learn the most about shooting in the editing room. You're sitting there. I can't tell you how many times I've yelled at the past version of myself, move the camera, Tyler, scoot back, do this. But then you think of that the next time you go shoot and you learn from the editing process. So that's the trick. Give the students the reps. They don't have to know how to do it when they walk in the room, but if they're doing it repeatedly, repeatedly, is that how you said that word repeatedly, then <laughs> you're going to see them continually get better continually get better. These are so great. This is so great, Lindsay. I love you do this. And the, the editing looks clean. Like it's not like it's a lot of times with students, what they do is they hold the camera too long. So you're sitting there for like three minutes, like watching them. They were very quick. There's, it's got a good um, speed to it. The rule of thumb for shooting video, if you're watching, is you don't want to stay on one shot for longer than three seconds. You want to transition to the next shot or you want to transition to something else within three to five seconds. So you're they're doing a great job. Well, thank you. You know, it took a lot of practice. Um, and realistically, looking back, I think if you were going to do this a lot in your classroom, we were not one to one with iPads school wide or district wide at this point. So anything that I wanted to do in my classroom, I had to stop and teach them how to create with clips. And then I could work it into my my lesson as a tool for them to communicate with after we had finished. So it, it took up time. But I think if your entire school or your entire district is one to one with these devices, then it's so much easier um, and a wise use of your time if they already know how to use that tool and then you just bring it into your lessons. So you know, what I love about kids and what I, the biggest difference that I've noticed in kids and then doing PD with adults, kids are not afraid to just punch all the buttons in an app. So if you're thinking like, oh, I'm nervous to try this out in my classroom, it's going to take, take me forever to teach them how to, they, you know what, you just put it in their hands and you say, hey, this is clips, see what you can do with it. You will be amazed at what they will create in just a very short amount of time. Oh yeah. And it's all you're doing there is you're increasing student engagement. You are showing them, <clears throat> you're giving them something that you don't have to worry about classroom management because they're so engaged in what they're doing. They're doing something they want to do and you're funneling the learning within your classroom through that. And so you're going to see a huge amount of engagement. So <clears throat> Lindsay, you want to talk through a couple of these programs and what you, when you recommend they use these in their classroom? Absolutely. So with clips, Clips and iMovie are on iPad, of course. So with Clips, I used Clips pretty much um, for every beginner that I that I work with. Um, and that was students in my classroom. My I had a student news team for a while. We started out with Clips. And even in PD, getting teachers creating videos, I start with Clips. I always start there just because it's such a great way to visually see how a clip of a video works and how you can trim it and edit in a very simplified way. And then once I feel like I have worked with either a group of students or a group of teachers with creating video to a point to where they are wanting more, then I'll move to iMovie. And 
that's kind of what I did with my student news team. The first nine weeks that I have them, I would work with clips and these were fifth graders at the time. So I would work in clips for the first nine weeks or maybe the first 12 weeks. And then we would move over to iMovie slowly because there, we needed the green screen capabilities and things like that. So um, clips and iMovie, clips for beginners. And then iMovie, when you start to feel like you have used all of the resources built into clips and you're wanting more. And then, of course, Final Cut Pro is the advanced video creation tool for the experts beyond iMovie. If you start to feel like, oh, I've maxed out on iMovie and there's still things that I want to be able to do, but the tools just don't exist on this platform, then Final Cut Pro is your man. Um, but I also included something on here just in case there are listeners listening in that do not have access to um, iMovie or a class set of iPads. And I have used WeVideo for editing with my students in the past. We had just two iPads and then the rest of our devices were Chromebooks um, in this scenario that I'm talking about with a news team. And what we would do is we put the WeVideo app on our iPads and then we also, of course, accessed it, that their accounts through uh, their Chromebooks. So with those two iPads that we had, we would keep those in the film studio and we would video with those. We would use those to capture all of our video. And then we would drop those videos into WeVideo. And then the kids in the editing room would just open up those videos in WeVideo and they could all edit and have their hands on it at the same time since we were limited with devices. So that's one workaround if you find yourself limited and you just don't have enough devices to get them into all of your students' hands at the same time. That's a great alternative. So good. So good, Lindsay. I, I am an advocate for all of those. I think they are, um, depending on what you need and what your budget is, you can find something that works within that. So um, <clears throat> do you want to talk about some of these video styles we've got uh, examples of in the background? Yes, but I wanted to talk just a minute about where you can share your videos. We had that on oh, the yes. previous slide yeah. down on the platform just a little bit. Sorry, I got too excited. That's on me. <laughs> okay. I was so excited. You got so me hyped. I was ready. That's okay. We talked about creating videos, but let's talk about where you can share them. Um, so in the examples that you saw just a moment ago, I shared all of those in Instagram. And you can set up your Instagram, if you're worried about student privacy, you can set up your Instagram to where you have a private Instagram account and you um, allow people to follow you. People have to ask for, for permission. So you would just let in parents of your students or, you know, only show things that you have the, the that those students have permission to share their content on that platform. You might need to get some special permission or you know permission forms signed by parents if you're going to be sharing out on a platform that just anybody can see. So keep that in mind. Another thing that we have done is Padlet. I love Padlet. Um, Padlet has a lot of different formats that you can look at, but there's one that actually looks like a blog where it's just a continuous line of content and you can just put video after video after video and then students can comment, they can like, and you can adjust all of those settings to allow likes and comments and, and all of those things. And with Padlet, you have the ability to actually um, see the comments before they post if you want to. You can set that on to where you can make sure that you're screening the comments before they post. I use Padlet a lot with my high school students and that comes in very handy, being able to screen those comments before they actually post, just making sure that we're keeping everything kind and courteous. Um, and then Flipgrid, I, I love Flipgrid. How do you feel about Flipgrid, Tyler? Have you used this a lot with your students? I haven't. I've used it a couple times um, with different things I've been a part of. I've used it, but you know, I always kind of, um, always kind of just lean into YouTube. So I, I, I don't have a ton of experience on Flipgrid. I've heard some great things about educators using it though in their classroom. Okay, and then of course YouTube is where um, Tyler is very proficient. He has a large YouTube channel, lots of content. Um, what would you suggest if teachers are wanting to post a student? vlog content on YouTube, how would you suggest that they do that safely for students? So a lot of it depends on what your district and the parents of your students are okay with. I'll be honest, we live in a world where it's more normal to post it publicly than to post it privately. 
it's almost like when you say, oh, that's a private video, it sounds like it shouldn't be allowed. And so, um, you know, whenever I was a principal, I had a school of sixth or 12th grade and I would ask, like our default was we're allowed to post, sign this if you don't. And I think out of, you know, hundreds of students, we'd have maybe 10 people that would sign saying they didn't want us to post. And here's the thing. Every time I'm like taking a picture or recording a video or they're making a video and they're wanting to post it onto our YouTube channel, I check their name. I'm like, hey, you can't. Your parents signed something saying they don't want to. Every single time that happened, they go, hold on one second. They call their parents and make their parents like tear up that document. Like it was like they didn't understand what they were signing. Most people like the ones that we had to be the most careful with were kids that were like in foster care or where there was some sort of situation where they didn't need to be posted on the internet because of family issues. It was, I don't think we ever had a case where they were like, no, please don't promote me. Like you've said earlier, every kid wants to be a YouTuber. Their only request when you post a video or you tag them in a photo is they're like, Hey, make sure you tag me so I can get followers. Like that's all they want. Like, please give me credit. And that's what they want. We had an open channel at our school where students, we would, I would create announcement videos. We'd create videos for the school, but then also students are generating content and putting it up there. And I never, we never had an issue at our district. Now I know every district's different. Every community is different. I would always check with your administrator and your, um, see what your, your like rules for your school are. And then whatever that is, play within the context of that. Students are always going to want to make you want you to make it public. And now YouTube makes it where you can tag people on different channels. So I encourage them. So if you're going to have anywhere you like a channel for your class or your school where students are making the content, I would recommend doing that with a school email account. Everything else I recommend you do with your own personal Gmail account, because that way you can have more control over it. You take it with you. But if student if student content, put it on a school account. And I always tell the students, if you want to post it on your account, you're more than welcome to as well. And so that way the students have content for their channel. They're putting it here and you can tag people's channels in the title now so that it'll cross like you're, you're essentially sharing audience and that's what they want. They want to build a platform. They want to build a channel and that helps move that forward. And kids get all on board with that. Am I right, Lindsay? Like back to the future three, all aboard. You know what I mean? Flying yes. trains. My, um, my son calls it clout. I don't know. He's like, I need you to tag me in that mom so I can get some clout. <laughs> That's right. He ain't wrong. <laughs> so it's strange, but Hey, if they get into it and that motivates them, then I'm all for it. Yeah. And just a fun, like just knowledge on this. When you upload a YouTube video, you have three, we have more options, but there's three main options. If you say it's private, that means nobody can see it. Just you because you own the channel. <laughs> if you say public, Anybody can watch it, find it, all of that. Unlisted, that's kind of like your safe zone. Unlisted means that you cannot see it unless someone gives you the direct link to it. And so a lot of people that don't want it out there, but they want it accessible by their, their parents and their students, they'll put it as unlisted and share the link. Awesome. Yes. <clears throat> so let's roll in. We're ready to roll into some videos, get some yeah. example vids. Yes. The big game strong, Lindsay. Yes. So if you wanted to use vlogging in your classroom, um, Tyler has created a list of video styles. And I, I love this. And I wanted to include this in this presentation today. <clears throat> and if you wanted to, you could even post these in your classroom for them to refer back to and give them, like you mentioned earlier, a choice board where they have a way to demonstrate their understanding and they can choose a way to communicate that, whether it be a video. And then you have all of these video styles for them that you've already talked to them about that you've already introduced them to. Um, and they can go back and be like, Oh yeah. Okay. So here's how I want to communicate this. And then they can create their video. So this is just a, a further way to empower them to create awesome videos. Yep. So let's talk about this first one traditional board focus <clears throat> is this how you did your first instructional videos just on a whiteboard it's exactly what i did i had a sony camera i bought in 2007 put it on a stack of books and i recorded this during my i think this was actually in the summer you know they give you summer pd hours for working in your classroom i was done after like 45 minutes so i was like <laughs> well, i guess i'll record a few basic videos toss them up and this is actually my most viewed video on youtube now um and it you can tell it was 2008 because look at that backwards hurley hat looking like a boss am i right nope okay sorry. how how old are you like 19 in this video oh, it feels like it i was i think i was 23 in this video now 
Yeah, that's 13 years ago. Wow. Wow. Time time rolls on. There's a lot of country songs probably about that. I don't know. I listen to country, but I'm sure there's songs about it. So yeah, this is super easy to make. Super simple. You can prop a phone. That's the thing. You can use your phone for almost all this. Prop a phone on some books or a tripod. Film yourself in front of a board explaining something. Or your students can do the same thing and take turns. I actually had students back in 2009. They could do a project where they would film themselves teaching and then send it. They actually sent them on DVDs. Remember those? Rest in peace. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yes, that's awesome. So if you logistically wanted to use this in your classroom, how could you make this work for students to where they had the flexibility and the space to create this type of video? Would you just have like a video shooting booth that would be flexible and then they could kind of go in there? I have some extra closets in my classroom that I don't necessarily use as closets that, you know, there is some storage, but they always double for extra um, purposes. And so I'm thinking that this upcoming year that I'm going to use one of those spaces for either a place to podcast from or a place to create video from that's just flexible and they can do what they need to do in there. That's awesome. Um, also, before I bought like dollar dry erase board, like portable dry erase boards, and the students can just write and hold it up. Um, also, if you're using TikTok, they make it super easy to do green screen. So you could film a video on Jamboard on your computer or on the board of them writing, and then they could put that behind them and then talk over what's happening. So there's a lot of ways to get creative with this, and it's super simple to do and explain. Um, that TikTok green screen tip is such a power move. I didn't think about that. That's awesome. That's a wonderful yep. idea. That's why you brought me in, Lindsay. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's great. Speaking of, um, here's an example of, this is, I call this the Khan Academy style. This is the least dynamic from all the research studies I'm looking at. This is the one that students, they don't connect with as well because there's not a human being. It's like a voiceover. It's like the Wizard of Oz, man behind the curtain. It's like they're, they're just seeing the writing on the screen or on the tablet. I would not recommend this, but it's super easy to do. You don't need a space. You can literally have the students on their iPads or their devices and they could just talk over and then do it. So you need a screen, Castify, Loom, Canva, all those. And it's really simple. I usually use for this one was explain everything. It's an app. And so any thoughts, any other thoughts on that, Lindsay? This is the most boring yes. one. So I don't know if we want to talk about it a ton. It, it is, there is a huge lack in connection with this one, but, um, I actually use this one a lot in my classroom when I create videos for my students because I make tutorial videos of um, how to use the Adobe uh, software. So it's so complex that sometimes I just need to have that screen there and walk them through different processes. Um, but <clears throat> I just use QuickTime on my Mac and oh, it yeah. captures the screen and the audio. And then on your iPad now, on your control, uh, center when you drop down and you turn on screen record there if you hold down the record button it'll give you the option to turn on the microphone so as you're screen recording it will it will capture your audio at the same time which is nice so so nice it's all so good, good. <clears throat> so yeah, good I completely agree built in with the iPad so depending <laughs> on the devices you have in the class you can make that work Yes, and a great um, option for the whiteboard is either Keynote just with a white background or even in Numbers. I've used that as a whiteboard before too because you've got different tabs so you can date it and then use that one that one sheet because you can take everything out, all the text boxes and everything. So you have just Numbers open, blank canvas with tabs at the top and then you just make your tabs, either your dates or your content topics and then you have a blank screen to use as an interactive whiteboard. So that's so good, Lindsay. That was so well said. That was so good. So good. There's this is another one. This one's pretty easy. This is, I call this tra traditional lecture style. This will you could prop a phone up. Actually, for this video, I prop my phone up on a trash can. And so uh, I don't know if that says a lot about the video, but that's what I did. And it's super easy. You're just hitting record, get some decent lighting, which we're going to talk about some video tips here in a second. And um, it's super easy to do. The only problem is you're not doing any graphics, designs, text, but you can film it super quick, super easy and get it out there. This this type of video, I recommend this if you are going to start doing community connection videos for your class. Like, you know how we do like daily announcements where you talk to your class, tell them what's coming up. If you do that for your class and you post that into your LMS, I highly recommend just doing this. You can upload it to YouTube, make it unlisted or public if you want parents to be able to find it. I know when I was a principal, I did those announcements and parents loved it. Because believe it or not, 
kids don't always take your notes home to their parents. So this way parents can stay up to date about what's happening just by watching the YouTube channel. And it also helps you build the rapport with the parents before you have to talk to them in person. I'd have parents that I'd never met with. They'd come in and they felt like they were my friend because they'd been watching our announcement videos before I told them their kid acting great. You know what I mean? So this is a great, easy way to build connection with them just on topics. Now, if you're doing like a deeper learning, I don't recommend it because you're not having any visuals um, in collaboration with it. So thoughts, Lindsay? Yeah. Um, if you have iPads in your classroom, then this is an awesome tip. This was something I really struggled with before we moved to iPads um, because we had Chromebooks and it was just a little harder to with the mobility aspect. It was harder that they just weren't as flexible to take out and record video and then throw them into an editing app. So this is awesome. I think our kids will really get into this. This is exciting. Hey, question in the chat. Have you ever done like a community type video for your class where you send them either updates or, hey, I'm just checking in. Tell me your favorite pizza place in the chat. In the chat, let us know if you've ever done that and then how it went. I would love to know. Have you ever created those types of videos for your classes? Okay, so this next one, I call this one the conversational one. This is like, it's almost like a, this actually is a video of a podcast. I think this is a highly underutilized uh, method of teaching and learning uh, because think of this, okay? Yes, students can do this where they have a conversation about something and it's a lot less pressure on the person speaking. You and I were talking about before, before we hit record. If it was just one of us doing this presentation, all the pressure's on me to do the transitions, to do the talk, to fill in all the space of the conversation. Whereas if I'm talking, it gives you a break to look at what you wanna say next. And then you also can add a perspective that I don't add and vice versa. And so I think it's really good to have this conversation, but even that's for students. Think of this for teachers. Say you teach AP US history and you wanna teach about something. You wanna teach about you know, the Revolutionary War. Instead of you just giving a monologue to your students for 45 minutes about what you know, how cool would it be to grab the other AP US history teacher and you guys have a conversation about it. Like the best podcasts are the ones that like, where you, it feels like they're your friends sitting in a room, just hanging out, talking about something you care about. You could start doing that and it makes the time go by faster and it feels more like they're a part of the conversation and not like you're presenting at them. So I don't know, have you ever created any of these? Any of these? And if so, you or your students, and then what are your thoughts on that? I agree with you. And I think from a viewer standpoint, these are highly engaging. I love to watch videos that are, are conversational. It just feels very authentic. Um, it feels relaxed. And then of course there's always, you know, I, I watch all of your videos with, um, who is this guy that's in this video? I've watched a few of them. He's hilarious. Yeah. He's you, my friend Neil. He's way better than me at everything. No, no, not necessarily, but it's just fun. You know, it's fun. It's authentic. It's relaxed. Um, and same thing with podcasts. I agree with you. The ones that are conversational and you get those two different perspectives about a topic. I think it just broadens the content. And it, it provides more more things for people to be able to relate to whenever you're talking about a content, a way to connect. So absolutely. Plus, you can have those different perspectives. I'll tell you some people that did this really well. So there's two um, YouTubers, they're Tom Ritchie and Hip Hughes, and they're both like history YouTubers. You ever heard of them? You ever heard yeah. either of those guys? Mm -hmm. So they're popular history YouTubers. What they do is like, uh, they're both teachers, so they still try to give unbiased information whenever they're presenting. But, you know, Tom leans a little more Republican, I think in his personal views, and then Hip Hughes view, leans a little more Democrat. One really cool thing they do in this style is leading up to elections, they do like debates among history teachers. And I think that is so <laughs> cool. And it's a great way to add that, um, add that dynamic of two different perspectives, but they're also like, they're educators. So they care about giving the full range of context for both sides for their audience. And so I think that's just a really cool perspective. I do too. So. And I think, I think kids would have a lot of fun with this because anytime that they get to interact, I mean, you think about our school day, so much of their time is spent sitting in a seat, being quiet. And if, if you give them, if you're like, Hey, you can go talk and you can record it. I think that they would really enjoy that. That would make, that, that time period of them demonstrating what they've learned, something that they really have fun with, which is what we want for them. So good. Elizabeth Colton said she agrees because it's authentic and relaxed. And I agree. It feels like a conversation. It feels very chill. It doesn't feel like as much pressure. So I totally agree. Plus it's easier to stretch out a video if you need longer content. Um, so here, this is a pretty simple one. This is just uh, vertical with text. This is 
where essentially what, uh, what you can do is you can take your phone and you turn it vertical and you can record that and then you upload it into iMovie or Final Cut Pro or whatever editing software you're using. And then you have text on the side. Some it's really easy to do this with like Screencastify or Loom or one of those other programs. You talked about doing it with Keynote earlier, but it's just a little bit more editing, but it adds that text dynamic um, to where you're doing it. A lot of PDs that I do, I'll have it to where I will throw in like questions while I'm speaking. And so it's almost like you're having a narrator in text along with you speaking on camera, which adds to the engagement factor. Awesome. So if you wanted to empower your students to use this, how would you teach them to do this in a simple way? That yeah. So what I would do is I'd have them essentially get bullet points for what they want to talk about. And then with each bullet point, come up with a question that starts that, that their audience can answer. And then what they'll do is they can use StreamYard like we're using right now. They can use Screencastify and just pop up those screens with those questions. It's all about creating a conversation on the side while you're speaking. And so if you're not going to edit afterwards, the easiest way to do it is to have it in your presentation and then ask them verbally, but also ask them via text because that double reinforcement really, you get a better chance of seeing engagement in the chat or in the comments. Awesome. Okay, and then we talk about mm -hmm. vlogging in the classroom. This is one of my favorite uh, types of videos. If you were like Tyler, what would you do? What's your dream job? My dream job would be to do this, to travel around and teach people on location for different things around the world. Um, you know, I was a history teacher or a history major in college, but I ended up teaching high school math. So it's like, I didn't really get to utilize all the history stuff that I love and the context and the structures of all that. I didn't get to do that, but now I get the chance to make those videos and put them out anyways for people on the internet. And so this, I had a layover. It was actually at, you remember at ADE is when we went to the Apple distinguished educator thing in 2019, I had a layover. And so I was hanging out in DC for like six hours and I rode a scoot scoot around a little scooter action. <laughs> and made these videos. And this is whenever you take, talk about vlogging, this is the traditional look of a vlog. It's very authentic. It feels very natural. It feels like you're standing next to a person talking about different stuff. And so I did that with this Washington Monument is this video, but I don't know, what are, what are some thoughts on vlogging? Why do you feel like this style resonates with young people with regards to videos? Well, I think because it's just so raw and authentic. Um, and I think in the classroom, like this is out, you know, like out in the world. And, but I think if you're going to do this in school, you do have to give them some flexibility with maybe going out in the hall, maybe going down the hall, you know, you'd have to build up that expectation and the trust with your students um, and give them some strict guidelines. But I think that they just really buy into this type of content, which is going to be why they're going to be more motivated to, you know, to communicate this way. Um, yeah. But yeah. And I think, in my classroom, I teach graphic design. So we do a lot of teamwork. We do um, a lot of, it's all project-based learning. So if they documented all of that process in this format, then it's going to capture for me a much better picture of what they've been working on and what they've learned through that than it would if they just wrote me a paragraph at the end of the project. So that's why I think it's so valuable. That's so good. That's so good. I love that. Here we go. Okay, so um, I'm working on my dissertation right now, and I'm looking at a lot of research studies. And these are kind of some of my thoughts about what I'm seeing in research studies on how to best like grab students attention, keep their engagement and then lead to long term retention. Um, and so obviously, like you want to start branding, roll in, talk to them as an individual. One of the things that when we make videos, we don't think about is we're like, hey, everybody, thanks for showing up the person watching that is not with everybody. They're probably on their phone by themselves. Okay. So let's talk to them. Hey, how are you today? Are you having a good day? That means I'm making eye contact with you and I'm talking to you as an individual. Um, remind them of who you are, how to connect with you. Um, hey, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, tell them what you want, how they can find you later. Um, you know, community connection. I think it's important that you ask them a question, how they can participate in the chat. Let us know your favorite YouTuber. It's a great way to get them started in the conversation. Um, after that, hit them with the agenda, big topic and why they need to learn it. I'll, I'll end with this and then we'll let you, I'll let you roll into this, Lindsay. I'm looking at all these research studies and it talks a lot about why people stop watching videos. And there's a bunch of reasons people will quit watching the video. There are two reasons on the bar graph though, that are way ahead of everywhere else. It's like the Usain Bolt reasons. They're way ahead of everyone else. Okay. <laughs> um, the two reasons that matter the most 
with regards to people watching videos, especially educational videos, is they need to see how it applies to them and they don't need to be confused. Okay. How many of you guys like to watch a movie when you start 30 minutes into it and nobody can explain what's going on? You don't want to be confused. And also when you're looking up stuff to learn, if you start watching a video, but you don't, you can't connect how that video, which you thought was going to teach you what you need to learn. You don't see how that connects you to what applies to you. You're going to quit watching. So we have to constantly remind our students and our audience, one, how this is going to apply to them. And two, we need to keep clarifying what's happening so they aren't confused about what's going on. Um, so after that, we talked about the beginning, tell a story, story stick. Okay. The framework for this is a uh, Myers uh, study where it's the, um, the theory of multimedia learning, where it's like, how do we retain that information? And it's auditory, it's visual. And then we tie that into previous learning. It's the same thing we do in person in class. We tie into stuff we taught a week ago. We tie into things in the real world. We try to tie into stuff. Um, it's just trying to emulate that in video as opposed to just being like, today's video, we're talking about, you know, quadratic formula. You know what I mean? Like you want to tie it in. And if you want, I've got a template. If you want to start making videos or you want your students to start making videos, this link right here, this goes to a temp, not that this link goes to a template that um, you can use. It's a Google doc. You can make a copy and you can go in and use it as a template for making videos. Students can fill this out before they start recording so that you're not watching a video where it's a lot of, uh, and then, uh, some more stuff happened. <laughs> I guess, uh, some, you know, it, it allows them to build a script almost bullet points for what they need to talk about and then also maximize that engagement. So if you want that tutorial, that template, you got that. Did we give them this presentation? If not, you can go to my Instagram bio, Tyler Tarver. It's linked in there. Um, unless Lindsay wants to, um, you know, she's going to put it in her bio. Link in your bio too, right, Lindsay? Yes. That's yes. what I'm talking about. Okay. Absolutely. Any other thoughts um, on this? <laughs> I love the template because I feel like a lot of times with my students, especially in high school, they are so reluctant to create at first. It's hard to get them over that, that initial, I guess, fear of putting themselves out there and creating. But I feel like if you give them something like a template and you show them lots of examples and lots of different avenues that they can go down. And then just like here, just follow this template. A lot of your more reluctant creators will will jump into it at that point. You're making video creation a lot more accessible for them and they can see how they can be successful. A lot of my top, my type A students who want to be perfect in every way, a lot of times video, something creative like this, they're terrified of it, right? Because they can't see themselves being perfect from the beginning. And the thing about video creation is that you just have to start you just start. And of course, it's not going to be perfect at first, but you just have to keep going. And that's really hard for our older students who are so socially aware. It's really hard for them to jump in and do, especially when we talk about sharing it with a greater audience. So I think the template here is so powerful in getting students over that initial fear of jumping out and creating and kind of putting themselves out there. You have to be really vulnerable when you create a video. So um, I think this is a really great tool. Wow. Thank you so much, Lindsay. <laughs> Have you okay. seen that, that uh, TikTok? Thank you so much, Karen. I appreciate that point of view. Right. Yes. I love so that. Good. That's so good. Okay, so let's talk about tools um, and what you can use in the classroom. Um, you talked about what camera should you use. And um, I love this. It's the best camera that you have is the one that you have on you in the classroom. If you have iPads, if you have access to that, it's, I mean, I feel like it's the Swiss army knife of tools. If you don't have an iPad, of course, student phones are a great option. You know, they've got them. They all have them. We fight that battle every day of trying to get them to put them away, but this way you would be using them for good. So, um, yeah, whatever they have. If you don't have a class set of iPads, then ask them to get their phones out. It's perfect. Yeah. Or just hit up Lindsay. Lindsay's a multimillionaire. She'll donate the iPads to your classroom. <laughs> Not quite. No. <laughs> okay. So do you want to describe your illustration here of shooting tips? I love Tyler's illustrations, guys. I, I think they are the greatest thing ever. He thinks I'm joking. I am so serious. I love this so much. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the brief rundown, but then I've got a link to where you can get like, if you say you wanna like tell your students what I'm about to talk about, I've got a video that you can just give them and they can, it goes through this with a video. So quick tips, 
hold the phone eye level. You go up here. That's a MySpace photo. If you go down here, that's like everybody's dad on Facebook. I don't know if this is working. You want an eye level, eye level for your camera. Okay. So if you want to hold your phone right now, eye level. The other thing, have you ever watched a video from somebody and it's like, they're kind of looking at you, but they're not looking at you. It's like in the office, whenever Dwight's like, Jim, meet my eye line. And Jim's looking up here. He's like, meet my eye line, Jim. That's what we're doing. You know why? Because we're looking at ourselves on our phone, every Zoom call. It's like, why aren't they looking at me? Because they're not looking at the camera. Look at the camera. Whenever you hit record, the camera's up here. Look right here. Don't stare at yourself when you're recording a video, okay? Make sure you're on screen. Make sure it's hitting record. Watch the seconds go one, two, three. Boom, stare straight at that camera, okay? Because then you're looking in their eyes whenever they're watching the video. Other than that, it's all about lighting. Um, don't be in direct sunlight. That looks like you're being beamed up to heaven. Don't be in the dark. It looks like your Blair Witch Project. What you wanna do is you wanna have decent lighting. Um, rule of thumb is if you have, like you can be in the shade if you're outside, if you're inside, wherever the window is. So like say the window's over here, I want to record where the light from the window is on my face. It is lighting my face because if the window's to my back, then I'll be like a silhouette. Okay. You don't want that. That's like Jack the Reaper. You don't want that action. Okay. So make sure that you're using that light to light your face um, from the camera. And as far as audio goes, um, always think about what you want before you start recording. Don't get on there and be like, uh, there was something else. Uh, think of it. What a little trick. I'm gonna show you a trick. Write some bullet points on your on like a post-it. Stick the post-it on your on your phone, and then you can glance down at those bullet points as you're talking. Plus, the post-it will cover up your face so that you're not tempted to stare at your own stare into the beauty of your own eyes. <laughs> um, so, other than that, talk a little bit louder than you normally would. The only problem is that that carries on into real life, and you start yelling at everybody, which my wife tells me, Tyler you get on everyone's nerve because all you do is yell what's up everybody hey guys and so you know that's it that's what it is that's what i got lindsay what do you got what did i say um i would say that the number one tip to making good videos is audio it's i mean the audio makes it or breaks it if you can't understand what someone is saying in a video it just totally kills the vibe it's just done so yep. um you're going to have to do a voiceover or something. But I would say that that is number one thing to tell your students, how give them strategies for getting great audio in their video. Yep. And here's a video. I've got it on my YouTube channel, which you're on right now. Hit the red subscribe button, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but <laughs> you're on it right now. Um, if you want hit that subscribe so you can find it later. I've got this video on here. It's phone video tips. You can play it for yourself. You can play it for your students. It walks through pretty much everything we just did, but it also gives examples. Like here's what it looks like in front of a window. Here's what it looks like against the window. It talks through those different, uh, strategies and techniques. So if you want it, do it, just do it, do it. Just do I it. You remember that? that. Yes, so I love that Shia LaBeouf YouTube video. It is hilarious. You know, when I'm when I feel nervous about doing something and sometimes I'll tell my I'll be talking to my son. He's 14 now and he always just texts me that video. <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> and it's just a reminder that sometimes you just have to jump in and start. But sometimes it's so hard to get our students to a confidence level to where they are willing to do that. So I think just start really simple and give them all the opportunities for success with that right out of the gate to where it's not a, a thing to where they're nervous and stressed and you're not asking for perfection. You know, you're just teaching them how to use the tools in the beginning. So good. So okay. good. I love it. Four types of video storytelling. Cause five when makes me sick. It's too many. It's excessive, <laughs> Lindsay. It's excessive. It just pushes it right over the line. Okay. So go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. So these are a few models for storytelling. This one is probably one of my favorites. It's the easiest one to do if you're trying to plan for a video. Casey Neistat, he, he essentially took vlogging to the next level. Um, and he talks through in one or a couple of his videos, he talks through his ideas format for how he shoots and what he thinks through before he starts his day. Um, he's really good at showing his day, a story of his day, but also teaching you something in the process. Um, and so here's his model. He thinks of three things before he hits record. What is the setup? Okay. How do I erase confusion? We talked about that. Nobody wants to be confused. So the setup, okay. This is what's happening. I'm headed to work. The conflict. I can't find my keys. There has to be a conflict in it. Think of every movie you've ever seen. Oh no, Darth Vader is going to blow up the universe with the Death Star. So it's like, that's the conflict. 
And then there's resolution. We overcome it. We close our eyes and shoot the laser beams in the middle of the Death Star. Like you have to have a setup, conflict, and resolution. If you think through those three things before you create any type of vlog or video or your students, have them list these three things before they hit record. What is the setup? Hey, I'm a kid in a class and I'm trying to learn, you know, Pythagorean theorem. Here's the conflict. I can't memorize Pythagorean theorem. What is that formula? I can't memorize it. The resolution. Here's a song I made up to help remember what the Pythagorean theorem is. And that resolves my conflict. So I don't and know. You know this I love, what I love about this is that even if you don't teach a core subject area or if you don't teach English language arts, this reinforces that across any content area that where you're teaching them how to create video to express themselves. You're just reinforcing those important skills that they're going to need. So, I love so that. good. So good. Here's a quick template. <laughs> if you want to look at it, this is how most um, videos roll. There's like a preview clip. It's kind of like the mini trailer for the video you're about to watch. They hit you with an intro, the content outro, and then you leave them with some bloopers. It's like the toy story Two bloopers. You know what I mean? It's toy story bloopers. So here's another model real quick that I think is super good. This is called the Jenga model. This is where over the course of the video, the anticipation builds. Okay. In movies, it's very suspenseful. Um, you know, the departed, we know something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Boom. Something happens. This is very popular with YouTubers, especially ones that, um, you know, keep the shock and awe going. We want that anticipation to build. It's like a game of Jenga. It's going to fall. It's going to fall. When does it fall? And so let it build throughout it and then boom, it happens. And that's the end of the video. So that's another great way. Cliffhanger. You want a cliffhanger, Lindsay? You want people wanting more. <laughs> if you answer, This is like one of my favorite ways to do TikToks is at the beginning, I ask a question that I think my audience wants. Do you ever have trouble recording discipline in your classroom? Does it take up too much time? Let's try to work on that. And then my video builds towards here's the resolution to that conflict. And so sometimes I just start with the conflict. Um, and this next one is the story brand model. This is a way you can teach, not just for videos, but for your entire class. Don't come off like the hero. You are the guy. You are Yoda. Help your students be the hero. So a lot of people are like, I don't know how to edit video. I don't want to shoot. I don't want to be on video. Totally cool. You be the guide and let your students be on video. Let them be the hero. They want to be. They, that's the, the selfie generation. They want to be on video. So be the guide in that. Um, story brand is a great company to look at. There's a book called story brand. Um, check it out by Donald Miller. Uh, the last one, this is the TikTok model. And we've talked about glances of this. You're authentic with a loose script and then you hit the key points. Okay. It's like with that conversation model, this is a really cool way to do it. You want to come off real. Don't come off like Bueller, Bueller. You don't want to come off like that. Okay. You want to come off where you're hitting some high points, but you're going to have fun along the way. It's like swimming. Do you swim straight, Lindsay? Whenever you like close your eyes, you start swimming. Do you swim straight? You know, honestly, I just float most of the time. <laughs> That's fair. It sounds like a lot of us teaching over the past year and a half. I, uh, we're just know, floating. I'm tired to try to swim straight most of the time. That's but no, fair. I don't, I don't know. I guess I do swim straight. If I'm going to swim, I don't know that I would swim in a zigzag formation. I would probably. Well, I kind of lean off to the side. Whenever I close my eyes and I start going, I look up and I've like veered off down the, down the, the way. What the buoy model is when you're like doing a video or you're having a conversation on a podcast, what you do is you have these bullet points. They're your buoys. It's like, we may get off track. We may swim a little to the side, but then we're going to come back to the next buoy. That way we don't sit there and waste 45 minutes of our audience's time. We're hitting the high points, but we might tell a side story. Let me tell you guys something about Paul Revere. Paul Revere, and you go off and you tell like a side story. <laughs> it's okay to chase rabbits as long as we come back to home base occasionally. That's that's my thought. That was a rapid fire. I know we got to get people out of here, but that's a rapid fire. Uh, thoughts <laughs> on that, Lindsay. Okay, the four C's of building an audience. So we're going to empower your students to build an audience um, for who they are sharing their story from the classroom with. So let's talk about these three C's. We're going to have good content. Um, and of course, just bring them back to being authentic over perfect. I think that's the biggest yep. idea that we want to teach them is that this is not about portraying some sort of perfection, which I find a lot of my students really strive for, you know, and it makes them so nervous to put themselves out there. But I think that we just show them over and over and over again that, hey, flawed and authenticity is where it's at. It's what people can relate to. I agree. The only thing I would change on this is don't use Spark. Use uh, Canva. Canva is way better than Spark. That's the only change I would make to this entire slide. That's the only thing. And that's my fault for not updating it. That's on your boy. So sorry. 
Okay. And then we want them to be consistent. I think for me with creating content in the past, when I have tried to mapping it out over a couple of weeks and putting things on a timeline makes it so much easier for me to be consistent and to actually, uh, otherwise I procrastinate and it gets pushed off to the side and it just doesn't get published. So, um, and you know that firsthand <laughs> I procrastinate sometimes, but um, yeah, I think creating a schedule and then create, you know, encourage them to create all of their content and then slowly release it out to build that audience. That's good. Um, and what you can do a good way for me to be consistent is I film them in bulk. So I'll film like 10 videos in or like in a day or two, and then I'll schedule them out every week for 10 weeks. So I don't have to worry about filming anything else for 10 weeks because I do it in bulk. So that's just another trick. Um, collaboration is super important. Your students can collaborate with each other across their channels and collaborate with you and your education channel. They want to grow their audience. And the best way to do that is to share audiences with other people. And so collaborations are super easy, especially with students in your class. Let them work together. They can put the video on both of their channels and then they can share their audiences and promote each other. And this is probably the most important is help them build a community around their audience. This is for you as a teacher, building a community with your students and your parents and the local community, but also with them when they're doing it, they need to let their audience know that they are seen and that they want them to be a part of the conversation. So awesome. Good. I yeah. think you're one of the best I've seen at doing this. You create a community mm -hmm. in your class that students love being a part of. When it was the news station you guys were doing, all of these different projects, like you've done it at lower level, you've done it at the um, older student level, like you've done it everywhere. And I think you're one of the best at building a community within your your students and even in within your school. You allow your students, you empower your students, you're the guide and you let your students be the heroes and then they build that community in their school. I think you're one of the best I've seen at that. Thank you so much. That's a huge compliment. I, I don't see that, but thank you. I try. I try really hard. I value that. I think at the high school, it's so much more challenging than it was at elementary. Those elementary kids are just so enthusiastic and, expire, and excited and inspired to just do anything that you ask them to do. Um, but at the high school level, it is so hard. But I was also, last year was my first year at the high school. We were in the, in the middle of a pandemic. We all had masks on. So maybe next year will be a little a little better, but it was so, I feel like I was just constantly trying to bond with them and like get them to express themselves. So um, I'm hoping that I'll be more successful with that. I, I feel like I've learned some valuable lessons and maybe, maybe I'll be better at building that next year, but thank you so much for seeing that because I, well, I if you get better, that. it's going to make all of us look bad because you're already, <laughs> you're already a goat at it. Grace of all time. Thank you guys so much. Lindsay, thank you for letting me be a part of this. I, I was excited when you asked and uh, I'm still excited. I'm so pumped. Well, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on video. You are um, such a master at that. You're so great at that. You have so many great tools and processes and everything um, built up that you have created. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Again, if you want to connect with us later after this presentation, I've included our email addresses and then also our Twitter handles. And then we hope that you continue to tune in throughout the week of the Festival of Learning. Um, it's going to be a great week. There are lots of exciting sessions. And then if you want to look deeper into how you can create with iPad the Everyone Create, books are an awesome resource. And of course, the Apple Teacher Learning Center is a wonderful place to go for all kinds of ideas and tips and um, resources for you as a teacher, as you grow in using Apple devices in your classroom. So. So good. Good job, That's Lindsay. Awesome. Okay. Well, if you don't have anything, I think we're done. Bye guys. Have a great day. Thank you guys so much. Thank y'all so much for hanging out with us.